I'm so happy to have Kevin Boulian. Now, there's a lot mentioned with your name here. President, CEO of NERAC Incorporated, global technology, IP advisory research firm, UConn grad, Hall of Fame business this year, correct? Correct. You're an angel investor. You love innovators, entrepreneurs. What got you started on your train of business innovators, entrepreneurs, angel investors? Who were you as a kid? <laughs> Let's start there. Start there. I worked for my dad's construction company. So my dad was an entrepreneur and his dad was an entrepreneur. And so from a very early age, I got a huge dose of what it meant to have a family business and to run a business. And it's in my blood. It's hard to have a family business. The infighting that goes on sometimes and to making, and family businesses that last generations, they get a pat on the back because it's really hard. So you go, you end up going to UConn, then what happens? So uh, I graduated from UConn in 1980 with a BS in finance. Uh, if you can remember, uh, those were the years of uh, Jimmy Carter being president and it was the Carter recession. So interest rates were skyrocketing high. There were lots and lots and lots of firms that were letting go folks. Here I am with a BS in finance, new to the job market, and all of the entry level jobs are being scooped up by the folks who are being laid off who already have their Series 7 license. Sounds familiar. Yeah, just like now. So uh, I, I scoured and searched and looked and took the one job that I could find, which was with a very small research firm called NERAC, uh, very close to the University of Connecticut where I went to school, and my job was in telephone sales. It was the one job they had that was open. That was the job I was going to do. How hard is sales? <sighs> Nothing harder. Why? Why? Because it demands the most of you. Uh, you need to be an active listener. You need to understand what your customer or your buyer is looking for. You need to be able to discern whether what you're offering is a good fit or a match. Do they really need it? Will it help them? Can they afford it? Those are all things that are critical for sales. Nira grows, you grow with it. And then what happens? So you're absolutely right. I didn't stay a telemarketer for forever. It was a couple of years and I was promoted into an accounting position. A couple of years after that, accounting manager. A few years after that, controller, then vice president, then executive vice president. And after 18 years, the founder and the former CEO was looking for an exit strategy. Uh, his view of the world uh, was one that didn't involve the World Wide Web. And I looked at the World Wide Web and said, my gosh, what an opportunity. I, I can only imagine what it would be like to connect NERAC's resources to customers all over the globe. And on the basis of that bifurcated view, his strategy for exit became my opportunity for acquisition. So I acquired the company that I had worked for for nearly 18 years. And what is that company now? Because you and I have been talking about you have to morph constantly. So what you did 10 years ago is not what you're doing now. And that's correct. And what I did when, we, when I took over the organization and launched it in a new direction, uh, harnessing the capabilities of the web, uh, only lasted five years. Then came Google. So <laughs> and I, I then tend, you Google everything. And you Google everything. I tend to measure the world um, uh, BGAG before Google, after Google. And so after Google, right, we were forced to examine, critically examine who we are, what value we can offer to the marketplace, how we can best deliver it. And when you look at the community of scientists and engineers who are working for me, delivering value-added analytical insight to our customers, you realize that they begin where Google leaves off. When Google gives you either too little or way too much for you to make an informed decision, you call upon an organization like mine. If you're in a scientific or engineering field, you call upon an organization like mine to assist you in gathering the right type of analytical insight so that you can make an informed decision about your business. This is above some folks' heads. In a nutshell, what's your elevator speech? Who comes to you? So, NERAC is a community of scientists and engineers who offer value-added research services to companies who are seeking guidance in areas of new product development, market research, intellectual property evaluation, areas that support innovation. Now, innovation is your sweet spot. You're, you're looking around to invest in folks who are building the future, especially in the state of Connecticut. What does it feel like to be an angel investor? It's way cool. Tell me about it. 
you know, you can't possibly imagine uh, how good it feels to take an individual or a group of individuals with an unproven but exciting idea and to sprinkle it with magic pixie dust, angel investment capital, and then to stand shoulder to shoulder, mentor, provide guidance and advisory insight, helping those new entrepreneurs to the next stage of their development. There's who, nothing like it. Who comes to you if somebody's seeing this interview and they're thinking, oh my gosh, he's an angel investor, maybe he can help me get to my next point to where I can get some capital, to where I can get this thing, this widget, you know, rolling. Who comes to you? So I tend to stick fairly close to home with my angel investment activities and I focus them nearly exclusively at the University of Connecticut. I spend a fair amount of time at UConn both within the School of Engineering, within the School of Business, and in areas where entrepreneurs are likely to gather and I'm mixing with students I'm uh, having discussions with faculty who have novel disclosures and ideas, and I'm encouraging those individuals to take a chance, to really do the research necessary to evaluate whether their idea has commercial merit, and then to look to ways to wrap that idea with a commercialization strategy that gives birth to a new company, brings a new product to market, and creates another opportunity for Connecticut to revisit its Yankee ingenuity roots. I love that Yankee ingenuity. So who do you have on the front burner right now that you can talk about that you're excited about investing in? Uh, so um, this, this is a great story. Uh, it was a couple of years ago. Uh, I was a judge uh, at the Innovation Quest competition at the University of Connecticut. And uh, a PhD student had approached his faculty advisor looking for technologies that he might enter into this competition. And Innovation Quest is a, is a program for students. And it allows a student to come forward with an idea. And through the competition, those ideas are judged. The winning ideas are then given an opportunity to build a prototype over a six week intensive course, at the conclusion of which those uh, prototypes can be presented to investors and prospectively launch new companies. So I came across this particular company early, early, early in its stages. I had had previous conversations with the faculty member. The PhD students that were participating were just scary smart. These are, these are bright, I love hearing that. bright students. And it was a second place finisher in this competition. And they rattled around UConn for about a year. They picked up some grant money to further develop the prototype. Uh, the idea is really a software product that enables the enhanced selection of the most maximally informative biomarkers for experimental genetic test design. Well, this is heavy stuff. It's, it's <laughs> fun stuff, but think about it. Personalized medicine, genomic medicine yeah. is our future. And here's a group of students and faculty collaborating on a technology and an idea that can help to revolutionize the way that those new drugs are being brought to market. So they play second and you said, hello. And I said, I've been here all along and I want to help advance your company. And over the course of time, we deepened the relationship. They found themselves as co-founders uh, sadly lacking on the business side. These are very, very smart scientists and they engineers. They can't do everything, right? But if they're focused on the kinds of things that they can do really well, right, you have to admit that you can't do everything. Right. And that's one of the keys. Uh, it, it's rare that I'm able to find uh, the kind of an early stage startup where they'll recognize that there are gaps in their knowledge or in their ability to address the market. Really? They, they don't, they think they know everything? They believe, based upon their knowledge of the science or the engineering, that the business will just follow I along. See. You need an equal measure of business expertise, strong, sound business experience and acumen to complement the really way cool technology. So if you take that technology and you wrap it with a commercialization strategy, a strategy born of experience, then it's quite likely that you give it better chance of success. So in addition to coming with my ideas and a small team of business advisors, this was one of those that required a small dose of magic pixie dust. And so the company was launched. It wasn't long after before they were introduced to the folks at Connecticut Innovations. What a great story Connecticut has to tell. What's the name of this company? Simple Bio, S-M-P-L, 
BIO, and Simple where they, Bio. And where are they now? Well, today they're inside the NIRAC building, which is host to nine other companies besides NIRAC in various stages of entrepreneurial growth and development. Which is great for the state of Connecticut. I want to read something. When you were inducted into the Hall of Fame, you said, quote, I have reached an age where I care less about my resume and more about leaving a legacy to the next generation. A critical component of this legacy is to inspire, teach, and mentor students and other budding entrepreneurs in Connecticut. I believe this little bitty state of three million plus, there's a lot of ideas floating around here, a lot of innovators, a lot of entrepreneurs, which happened when the Great Recession happened. And you said to me 150 years ago, you know, the same thing was happening. We were the land of Yankee ingenuity over time over time, we morphed and we became instead the land of steady habits. We need to recapture our entrepreneurial roots. We need to focus on creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship, a theme that is emerging in ever-growing strength at the University of Connecticut. And my job is to nurture that. My job is to inspire it. My job is to assist where I can, mentoring the next generation of entrepreneurial talent to rebuild and reinvigorate Connecticut's economy. Well, I can't think of a better leader to do that. Kevin, I appreciate you coming on. I understand why you're in the Hall of Fame at the business school at UConn. In leaving this interview, tell me what innovators and entrepreneurs in the state of Connecticut should be thinking about as we move forward in this state. Gosh, uh, when I look at the nature of the investment, that the state has made in its various systems of higher education. And when I look at the investment in NextGen Connecticut, at the University of Connecticut, when I look at Tech Park and all that it might be, it, it, it won't happen without people. So I'd like to put a speed bump up on Route 185, right? not far from my office. And I want to slow the graduates down just long enough, just long enough, so that they cast their gaze about and realize that there are opportunities for them here in Connecticut. They don't need to go to Boston, Austin, Houston, Santa Clara, San Diego, San Jose, right? They can look to Connecticut and various hotbeds of entrepreneurial activity within Connecticut instead. And they can build out their careers and they can achieve their aspirations here, right? For everyone's benefit. Kevin Bully, well said. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thanks for the invitation. Long live innovators. That's right. I made a trivial pursuit, spent one this end. Who is this girl I spent all night kissing? And if Walter's right here, then who else is missing? Got a little sidetracked to find my solution. I find the keys to the door, but it's also a metaphor. Need to keep locked in the grocery store of the mind. Just the same time. Skip right ahead in the last ride. The harder we look, the less 